Chapter 19 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. Leon Gambetta. On January 6th, 1883, Paris presented a sad and imposing spectacle. Her shops were closed, her public buildings and her homes were draped in black. Her streets were solid with hundreds of thousands, all dispirited and many in tears. A large catafalque covered with black velvet upheld a coffin shrouded with the tricolor. From a vase at each corner rose burning perfume, whose vapor was like sweet incense. Six black horses drew the funeral car, and 200,000 persons followed in the procession, many bearing aloft wreaths of flowers and shouting, Viva la Republic! Viva la Gambetta! The maker of the Republic, the brilliant, eloquent leader of the French people, was dead, dead in the prime of his life at 45. The Figaro but voiced the feeling of the world when it said, The Republic has lost its greatest man. America might well mourn him as a friend, for he made her his pattern for his beloved France. The Pall Mall Gazette said, He will live in French history among the most courageous, and even Germany courted him as the bravest of the brave, while she breathed freer, saying, in the Berlin press, The death of Gambetta delivers the peace of Europe from great danger. The hand that would sometime doubtless have reached out to take back sobbing Alsace and Lorraine was palsied, the voice that swayed the multitude, now with its sweet persuasiveness, and now with its thunder like the rush of a swollen torrent, was hushed. The supreme will that held France like a willing child in its power had yielded to the inevitable, death. Leon Gambetta was born at Cahors, April 2, 1838. His father was an Italian from Genoa, poor and of good character. His mother, a French woman, singularly hopeful, energetic, and noble. They owned a little bazaar and grocery, and here, Onasi, the wife, day after day, helped her husband to enjoy a comfortable living. When their only son was seven years old, he was sent to a Jesuit's preparatory school at Malfalcon, his parents hoping that he would become a priest. His mother had great pride in him and faith in his future. She taught him how to read from the National, a newspaper founded by Thiers, Republican in its tendencies. She saw with delight that when very young he would learn the speeches of Thiers and Guizot, which he found in its columns, and declaim them as he roamed alone the narrow streets and by the quaint old bridges and towers of Cahors. At Montfaucon he gave his orations before the other children, the mother sending him the much-prized National whenever he obtained good marks, and the Jesuits, whether pleased or not, did not interfere with their boyish Republican. At eight years of age, an unfortunate accident happened which bade fair to ruin his hopes. While watching a cutter drill the hand of a knife, the foil broke, and a piece entered the right eye, spoiling the sight. Twenty years afterward, when the left, through sympathy, seemed to be nearly destroyed, a glass eye was inserted, and the remaining one was saved. When Leon was ten years old, the Revolution of 1848 deposed Louis-Philippe, the Orleanist, and Louis-Napoleon was made President of the Republic. Perhaps the people ought to have known that no presidency would long satisfy the ambition of a Bonaparte. He at once began to increase his power by winning the Catholic Church to his side. The Jesuits no longer allowed the boy Leon to talk Republicanism. They saw that it was doomed. They scolded him, whipped him, took away the Nationale and finally expelled him, writing to his parents, You will never make a priest of him. He has an utterly undisciplinable character. The father frowned when he returned home, and the neighbors prophesied that he would end his life in the Bastille for holding such radical opinions. The poor mother blamed herself for putting the National into his hands, and thus bringing all this trouble upon him. Ah, she wrought better than she knew. But for the National and Gambetta's unconquerable love of a republic, France might today be the plaything of an emperor. Meantime, Louis Napoleon was putting his friends into office 
making tours about the country to win adherents and securing the army and the police to his side. At seven o'clock, on the morning of December 2nd, 1851, the famous coup d'etat came, and the unscrupulous president had made himself emperor. Nearly 250 deputies were arrested and imprisoned, and the Republicans who opposed the usurpation were quickly subdued by the army. Then the French were graciously permitted to say, by ballot, whether they were willing to accept the empire. There was, of course, but one judicious way to vote, and that was in the affirmative, and they thus voted. Joseph Gambetta, the father, saw the political storm which was coming, and fearing for his outspoken son, locked him up in a lyceum at Cahors till he was seventeen. Here he attracted the notice of his teachers by his fondness for reading, his great memory, and his love of history and politics. At sixteen he had read the Latin authors and the economical works of Proudhon. When he came home, his father told him that he must now become a grocer and succeed to the business. He obeyed, but his studious mind had no interest in the work. He recoiled from spending his powers in persuading the mayor's wife that a yard of Genoa velvet at twenty francs was cheaper than the same measure of the Lyon article at thirteen. So tired and sick of the business did he become that he begged his father to be allowed to keep the accounts, which he did in a neat, delicate hand. His watchful mother saw that her boy's health was failing. He was restless and miserable. He longed to go to Paris to study law and then teach in some provincial town. He planned ways of escape from the hated tasks, but he had no money and no friends in the great city. But his mother planned to some purpose. She said to Monsieur Meunier, the chocolate maker, I have a son of great promise, whom I want to send to Paris against his father's will to study law. He is a good lad and no fool, but my husband, who wants him to continue his business here, will, I know, try to starve him into submission. What I am about to propose is that if I buy your chocolate at the rate you offer it, and buy it outright instead of taking it to sell on commission, will you say nothing if I enter it on the book at a higher price and you pay the difference to my son? Meunier, interested to have the boy prosper, quickly agreed. After a time, she called her son aside and, placing a bag of money in his hand, said, This, my boy, is to pay your way for a year. A trunk full of clothes is ready for you. Try and come home, somebody. Start soon, and take care to let nobody suspect you are going away. Do not say goodbye to a single soul. I want to avoid a scene between you and your father. Ambition welled up again in his heart, and the bright expression came back into his face. The next morning he slipped away, and was soon at Paris. He drove to the Sorbonne, because he had heard the lectures were given there. The cab driver recommended a cheap hotel close by, and, obtaining a room in the garret, the youth, not yet eighteen, began his studies. He rose early and worked hard, attending lectures at the medical school as well as at the law, buying his books at second-hand shops along the streets. Though poverty often pinched him as to food, and his clothes were poor, he did not mind it, but bent all his energies to his work. His mother wrote how angered the father was at his leaving and would not allow his name to be mentioned in his presence. Poor Joseph! How limited was his horizon! Leon's intelligence and originality won the esteem of the professors, and one of them said, Your father acts stupidly. You have a true vocation. Follow it. But go to the bar, where your voice, which is one in a thousand, will carry you on, study and intelligence aiding. The lecture room is a narrow theater. If you like, I will write to your father to tell him what my opinion of you is. Professor Vallette wrote to Joseph Gambetta, the best investment you ever made would be to spend what money you can afford to divert from your business in helping your son to become an advocate. This letter caused a sensation in the Gambetta family. The mother took courage and urged the case of her darling child, while her sister, Jenny Massaby, talked ardently for her bright nephew. An allowance was finally made. In two years, Leon had mastered the civil, criminal, military, forest, and maritime codes too young to be admitted to the bar to plead, for nearly a year he studied Paris, its treasures of art, and its varied life. It opened a new and grand world to him. Accidentally, he made the acquaintance of the head usher at the corps legislative, who said to the young student, You are an excellent fellow, and I should like to oblige you. 
So if the debates of the Corps legislative interest you, come there and ask for me, and I will find you a corner in the galleries where you can hear and see everything. Here Leon studied parliamentary usage and saw the repression of thought under an empire. At the Café Procope, once the resort of Voltaire, Diderot, Rousseau, and other literary celebrities, the young man talked over the speeches he had heard with his acquaintances and told what he would do if he were in the house. An improbable thing it seemed that a poor and unknown lad would ever sit in the corps legislative as one of its members. He organized a club for reading and debating and was, of course, made its head. It could not be other than Republican in sentiment. In 1860, at the age of 22, Gambetta was admitted to the bar. His father was greatly opposed to his living in Paris, where he thought there was no chance for a lawyer who had neither money nor influential friends, and urged his returning to Cahors. Again his Aunt Jenny, whom he always affectionately called Tata, took his part. Having an income of $500 a year, she said to the father, You do not see how you can help your son in Paris. It may be for long years. But next week I will go with him, and we shall stay together. And then, turning to her nephew, she added, And now, my boy, I will give you food and shelter, and you will do the rest by your work. They took a small house in the Latin Quartier, very plain and comfortless. His first brief came after waiting eighteen months. Greps, a deputy, being accused of conspiracy against the government, Gambetta defended him so well that Crimaud, the prominent lawyer, asked him to become his secretary. The case was not reported in the papers, and was therefore known only by a limited circle. For six years the brilliant young scholar was virtually chained to his desk. The only recreation was an occasional gathering of a few newspaper men at his rooms, for whom his aunt cooked the supper, willing and glad to do the work, because she believed he would some day come to renown from his genius. Finally his hour came. At the coup d'etat, Dr. Bauden, a deputy, for defending the rights of the National Assembly, was shot on a barricade. On All Souls' Day, 1868, the Republicans, to the number of a thousand, gathered at the grave in the cemetery of Montmartre to lay flowers upon it and listen to addresses. The Emperor could not but see that such demonstrations would do harm to his throne. Delchuzet, the leader, was therefore arrested and chose the unknown lawyer, Gambetta, to defend him. He was a strong radical, and he asked only one favor of his lawyer, that he would hit hard the man of December, as those who hated the coup d'etat of December 2nd loved to call Louis Napoleon. Gambetta was equal to the occasion. He likened the emperor to Catiline, declaring that as a highwayman he had taken France and felled her senseless. For seventeen years, he said, you have been masters of France, and you have never dared to celebrate the 2nd of December. It is we who take up the anniversary, which you no more dare to face than a fear-haunted murderer can his victim's corpse. When finally, overcome with emotion, Gambetta sank into his seat at the close of his speech, the die was cast. He had become famous from one end of France to the other, and the empire had received a blow from which it never recovered. That night at the clubs and in the press offices, the name of Leon Gambetta was on every lip. It is not strange that in the elections of the following year he was asked to represent Belleville and Marseille, and chose the latter, saying to his constituents that he was in irreconcilable opposition to the empire. He at once became the leader of a new party, the Irreconcilables, and Napoleon's downfall became from that hour only a question of time. Gambetta spoke everywhere, and was soon conceded to be the finest orator in France. Worn in body, by the confinement of his secretaryship, and the political campaign, he repaired to Ems for a short time, where he met Bismarck. He will go far, said the man of iron. I pity the emperor for having such an irreconcilable enemy. The national, under Madame Gambetta's teaching in childhood, was bearing fruit. Napoleon saw that something must be done to make his throne more stable in the hearts of his people. He attempted a more liberal policy, with Emile Olivier at the head of affairs, but Gambetta was still irreconcilable saying in one of his great speeches, We accept you and your constitutionalism as a bridge to the Republic, but nothing more. At last war was declared against Prussia, as much with the hope of promoting peace at home as to win honors in Germany. Everybody knows the rapid and crushing defeat of the French, and the fall of Napoleon at Sedan, September 2nd, when he wrote to King William of Prussia, 
not having been able to die at the head of my troops, I can only resign my sword into the hands of your majesty. When the news reached Paris on the following day, the people were frantic. Had the emperor returned a defeated man, he could never have reached Tuileries alive. Crowds gathered in the streets and forced their way into the hall of the corps législatif. The eloquent leader of the Republican ranks, scarcely heard of two years before, ascended the tribune and declared that Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte and his dynasty have forever ceased to reign over France. With Jules Favre, Ferry, Simon, and others, he hastened to the Hotel de Ville, writing on slips of paper and throwing out to the multitude the names of those who were to be the heads of the provisional government. Cool, fearless, heroic, Gambetta stood at the summit of power and controlled the people. They believed in him because he believed in the Republic. Meantime, the German armies were marching on Paris. The people fortified their city and prepared to die, if need be, in their homes. Before Paris was cut off from the outside world by the siege, part of the governing force retired to Tours. It became necessary for Gambetta, in October, to visit this city for conference, and to accomplish this, he started in a balloon, which was just grazed by the Prussian guns as he passed over the lines. It was a hazardous step, but the balloon landed in the forest near Amiens, and he was safe. When he arrived in Tours, there was not a soldier in the place. In a month, by superhuman energy and the most consummate skill and wisdom, he had raised three armies of 800,000 men, provided a loan for their maintenance, and directed their military operations. One of the prominent officers on the German side says, This colossal energy is the most remarkable event of modern history, and will carry down Gambetta's name to remote posterity. He was now, in reality, the dictator of France, at 32 years of age. He gave the fullest liberty to the press, had a pleasant bonjour mon ami for a workman, no matter how overwhelmed with cares he might be, and a self-possession, a quickness of decision, and an indomitable will that made him a master in every company and on every occasion. He electrified France by his speeches. He renewed her courage and revived her patriotism. Even after the bloody defeat of Bazaine at Grevelette and his strange surrender of 170,000 men at Metz, Gambetta did not despair of France being able, at least, to demand an honorable peace. But France had grown tired of battles. Paris had endured a siege of four months, and the people were nearly in a starving condition. The communists, too, were demanding impossible things. Therefore, after seven months of war, the Articles of Peace were agreed upon, by which France gave to Germany fourteen hundred million dollars to be paid in three years, and ceded to her the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. Gambetta could never bring himself to consent to these humiliating conditions, and on the day on which the terms were ratified, he and his colleagues from these two sections of the country left the assembly together. Just as they were passing out, the venerable Jean Cous, mayor of Strasbourg, staggered up to Gambetta, saying, Let me grasp your patriot's hand. It is the last time I shall shake it. My heart is broken. Promise to redeem brave Strasbourg. He fell to the floor and died almost immediately. Gambetta retired to Spain, till recalled by the elections of the following July. He now began again his heroic labors, speaking all through France, teaching the people the true principles of a republic, not communism, not lawlessness, but order, prudence, and self-government. He urged free, obligatory education, and the scattering of books, libraries, and institutes everywhere. When Thiers was made the first president, Gambetta was his most important and truest ally, though the former had called him a furious fool. So ready was the great Republican to forgive harshness. In 1877, he again saved his beloved Republic. The monarchists had become restless and finally displaced Thiers by Marshal McMahon, a strong Romanist, and a man devoted to the empire. It seemed evident that another coup d'etat was meditated. Gambetta stirred the country to action. He declared that the president must submit or resign, and for those words he was sentenced to three months' imprisonment and a fine of $400, which sentence was never executed. McMahon, seeing that the republic was stronger than he had supposed, soon after resigned his position and was succeeded by Monsieur Grevet. Gambetta was made president of the assembly, and doubtless, if he had lived, would have been made president of the republic. There were not wanting those who claimed that he was ambitious for the supreme rule, but when death came from the accidental discharge of a pistol, 
producing a wound in the hand, all calumny was hushed, and France beheld her idol in his true light, the incarnation of republicanism. Two hours before his death, at his plain home just out of Paris, at Ville d'Avray, he said, I am dying, there is no use denying it, but I have suffered so much that it will be a great deliverance. He longed to last till the new year, but died five minutes before midnight, December 31, 1882. The following day, 15,000 persons called to see the great statesman as he lay upon his single iron bedstead. Afterward, the body lay in state at the Palais Bourbon, the guards standing near to their knees in flowers. Over 2,000 wreaths were given by friends. Alsace sent a magnificent crown of roses. No grander nor sadder funeral was ever seen in France. Paris was urgent that he be buried in Pierre Lachaise, but his father would not consent. And so the body was carried to Nice to lie beside his mother, who died a year before him, and his devoted aunt, who died five years previously. Every day Joseph Gambetta lays flowers upon the graves of his dear ones. Circumstances helped to make the great orator, but he also made circumstances. True, his opportunity came at the trial, after the Baudon demonstration, but he was ready for the opportunity. He had studied the history of an empire under the Caesars, and he knew how republics were made and lost. When in the corps legislatif a leader was needed, he was ready, for he had carefully studied men. When at Tours he directed the military, he knew what he was doing, for he was conversant with the details of our civil war. When others were sauntering for pleasure along the Champs-Élysées, he had been poring over books in an attic opposite the Sorbonne. He died early, but he accomplished more than most men who lived to be twice forty-five. When, in the years to come, imperialists shall strive again to wrest the government from the hands of the people, the name of Leon Gambetta will be an inspiration, a talisman of victory for the Republic. End of section 19